This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be mostly about rings in number theory. So I'll just start by very quickly recalling the definition of a ring. So a ring is something where you can do addition, subtraction, and multiplication, satisfying the usual rules of algebra. So some examples of rings. Um, we have the integers, usually denoted by z, the real numbers, and the complex numbers. And a particularly important example we've been studying a lot is the integers um, modulo n, which I'll denote by z, divided by nz for a reason that will be coming up um, fairly soon. Um, so saying they satisfy the usual rules of high school algebra is a little bit vague. So more precisely, the ring is a group under addition, more precisely an abelian group. So in other words, we have an identity with um, 0 plus a equals a plus 0 equals a. We have inverses a plus minus a equals 0 equals minus a plus a, and we have associativity, a plus b plus c equals a plus b plus c, um, and it, it has a multiplication um, with an identity um, that is commutative, we're only using commutative rings, so um, a times 1 equals 1 times a equals a, and a, b, C equals A, B, C. And finally, we have the distributive rules. I guess I should have said A, B equals B, A, because we're taking them to be commutative, because that A times B plus C equals A, B plus A, C. And if your ring wasn't commutative, you'd have to have a second distributive rule, but we won't bother with that. Um, so um, now I want to define quotients of rings. As, as a generalization of taking the integer modulo, modulo a, a number. First, let's define quotients of groups. And here I'm going to take the groups to be abelian or commutative, just to avoid some minor problems. So suppose that H is a subgroup of the group G. And I'm going to write the group G with an operation being addition. And what we can do is we can then define a quotient group, G modulo H, which is roughly where you get by make all elements of H equal to zero. So more precisely, what we do is we define an equivalence relation on G by saying A is congruent to B. You can say A is congruent to B modulo H if you want to include the subgroup H, to mean A minus B is in the subgroup H. And we can check this is an equivalence relation. Um, in other words, A congruent to B implies B congruent to A, and A is congruent to A, and A is congruent to B, and B is congruent to C, implies A is congruent to C. Um, moreover, it has the properties that if a is congruent to B and C is congruent to D, then A plus C is congruent to B plus D, and AC is congruent to BD, and so on. So multiplication and addition um, um, sort of preserves equivalence classes. And what this means is that um, we can um, define G over H to be either the set of equivalence classes Well, thinking of equivalence classes is a bit of a headache to think about. So, so usually we just take a set of representatives, psychological reasons of equivalence classes. And we've done this for the integers modulo n. So, so for example, if we take g to be the integers and h to be m times the integers, then g modulo h um, is just the integers modulo m, has more or less the same definition. And we can think of the elements either as being equivalence classes, so the equivalence classes would be things like you know, minus 2m, minus m, 0m, 2m, that would be the equivalence class containing 0, 
And then the equivalence class containing one would be this one and so on. But of course, um, humans, I mean, you know, think of an entire equivalence class as a real headache. Um, so instead of thinking of the equivalence class, if we just pick a representative element from each equivalence class and think of G over H in this case as being the set of element 0, 1 up to M minus 1. So we just pick one from each equivalence class and that's much easier to think about. So we can do the same for any abelian group and any subgroup. Um, if the group G is non-abelian, you can do something similar, but there are several um, minor complications. It doesn't work for all groups H. You need to take something called a normal subgroup, but we won't go into that because all our groups will be abelian. Um, and now we can do the same for rings. So suppose H Suppose G, no, suppose R is a ring. We want to define a quotient um, R modulo I. And um, you may think we can take I to be a, a, a subring, but that doesn't really quite work. Um, for, for a start, we've said that the um, subring has to contain the identity element I, and so you'd be the identity element one so you'd be saying one is equal to zero if you quotient it out and that, that that's just going to collapse this it turns out we need i to be um something called an ideal the name ideal comes from complicated historical reasons so first of all i is a subgroup of r under addition and this means we can define the group R over I under addition. And then we need multiplication to be well defined. In other words, we want to have the property that if A is equivalent to B and C is equivalent to D, then A plus then A times C is equivalent to B times D. And it's easy to check that this property follows if A so if the ideal i is closed under multiplication by elements of r, and it's important to notice that we're not saying i is just closed under multiplication by elements of i, we're saying it must be closed under all multiplication by all elements of the ring r. Um, and if, um, if the subgroup i has this extra property, then multiplication is well defined. So the quotient r over i is a is also a ring and the standard example is we just take r to be the integers and i to be the integers times m and obviously i is closed under multiplication by all integers so it's an ideal and again we find that z the integers modulo m form a ring so um, the construction of the integers modulo m generalizes to, con to, to, to any ideal, so any ring um, modulo um, any ideal. So let's have some further examples of this. Let's take the ring R to be the real numbers um, polynomials over the reals. And let's take the ideal i to be all multiples of the polynomial x squared plus 1. And we usually denote the set of all multiples of x squared plus 1 by just putting x squared plus 1 in parentheses. And um, yes, I know mathematicians overuse parentheses, and this is yet another overuse of them. So, so this just means all um, elements of the form f times x squared plus 1, where f is some polynomial. And then what is r over i? Well, um, um, any polynomial is a multiple of x squared plus 1 plus some linear polynomial. So, so, so its elements are just of the form a plus b times x for a and b real. And they're multiplied by setting, well, x squared plus 1 is equal to zero in this ring. So, so you can think of x as being the square root of minus one. So what we've done is 
we've actually just added a square root of minus 1 to the reals, and this ring is, of course, just the complex numbers, C, except we usually write x as being i, so, so we would have all the elements at a plus b i, with i squared equals minus 1. So the construction of the complex numbers and the construction of the integers modulo m are both special cases of taking a quotient of a ring by an ideal. Um, um, more generally, we can do this with any polynomial, so we can take the ring of um, polynomials and we can quotient it out by all um, multiples of f. So this is the ideal of all multiples of um, the polynomial. Um, and we'll see analogues of this coming up a bit later where we're going to replace r by, by something else. Um, now let's look at analogues of the Chinese remainder theorem. So the Chinese remainder theorem says that the integers modulo mn is isomorphic to the integers modulo m times the integers modulo n whenever m and n are co-prime. So what I want to do is to, is to have an analogue of this for rings. So here... Um, um, mz and nz are ideals of z. So what we should do is, is we should pick two ideals, i and j, of a ring R. Um, and then we have a map from ring R to r over i times r over j. So what is this? Well, this is a this is just a product of rings. So a product of rings is defined in more or less the obvious way. If we've got two rings r and s, then the product r times s is the set of all pairs r s with r in r and s in s. And this time, this is an ordered pair, not the ideal generated by r and s. Yeah, I'm sorry, notation is really ambiguous. And we just define addition and multiplication in the obvious way. So r1, s1, plus r2, s2, is equal to r1 plus r2, s1 plus s2, and r1, s2 times r2. So R1, S1 times R2, S2 is R1, R2, S1, S2. And you can figure out what the zero and one of this ring is. So um, we've got a map from the ring R to R modulo I, just projecting it, and to R modulo J. So we also have a map from the ring to the product of these two rings, which just takes R to its image in here times its image in here. And this is sort of looking a bit like the... Um, Chinese remainder theorem. So um, let's take another look at this. R maps to R over I times R over J. And we can ask, when is it on to? Well, the answer is it's on to when I plus J is equal to R. So I plus J is the set of things I plus little I plus little J for I in I and J in J. And if I plus J is equal to R, this implies that 1 is equal to i plus um, j for some i in i, j in, 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 in j. So now suppose a, b is in r over i times r over j. So, so, so we can think of a as being really in r. I mean, it's, it's not really. Um, um, so, so, sorry, um, we want to find some element r in the ring r such that it has image um, a in r over i and b in r over j. So what this means is r must be equal to a plus i for some i and it must be equal to b plus j for some j where we have picked representatives a of this element r over i, except now we're thinking of a as being an element of r. Well, we can solve for this because all this says is that i minus j is equal to b minus a, and we can solve for i in i and j in j 
because we said that any element of R, in particular B minus A, can be written in this form. So provided I plus J is equal to R, this condition is satisfied. And now uh, we notice that if M and N are co-prime, then, then Z M plus Z N is equal to Z. So this condition is satisfied for I, for, 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 for pairs of numbers m n a co prime which was the condition we had in the chinese remainder theorem so so we have a map from r to r over i times r over j whenever i plus j is equal to r so this is now on to well we would like this to be an isomorphism well it's not an isomorphism because there are lots of things mapping to zero so r in r maps to zero if and only if r is in i and it's also in j and this is also an ideal of r and so we get a map from r modulo i intersection j to r over i times r over j so this is now the intersection i j and again we notice that m z intersect m n z is equal to m n z if m and n are co-prime and um, we see this map is actually now an isomorphism so so um so we have an isomorphism whenever i plus j is equal to r so if we take r to be the integers we find as a special case of this that z modulo m n z is isomorphic to z over mz times z over nz which is the usual chinese remainder theorem so the chinese remainder theorem generalizes to um, um, much more general rings and ideals um, now let's look at unique factorization so you, you, you know z has unique factorization into primes and let's just recall the proof. So the main point, we have a division with remainder algorithm. So if we've got A and B, we can write A is equal to QB plus R with um, R having absolute value less than um, um, less than the absolute value of B. Um, and if we've got this division with remainder algorithm we can get euclid's algorithm where we can find the greatest common divisor of a and b and if we've got greatest common divisor of a and b we recall that um, if p is prime and p divides a b this implies p divides a or p divides b and this was the main um, condition we needed in order to show that z has unique factorization and we're now going to try and generalize these steps to um to more general rings so what we want to do to, is to show that if a ring has some sort of division with the remainder algorithm then it has unique factorization so we say r is a euclidean ring um, if it has um, division with remainder so we want to be able to write if, if we're given a and b in r we can write a is equal to b times q plus the remainder with the remainder being less than a well in order for this to make sense we need um some sort of absolute value on r so so this is going to be some function from r to the integers that are greater than or equal to zero um the, the, there are other variations of this but this will do for the moment and what we want is that um we have the absolute value of x is equal to zero if and only if x is actually equal to zero um, 
Um, and um, um, with this condition, you find that we can just copy all the proofs we had for the, the, the integers. Um, so, um, first of all, we can show that there's a Euclidean algorithm. Um, so this says that given A and B, we can find some element C with C a linear combination of A, X and B, Y, and C divides A and B. And we just copy the usual Euclidean algorithm for the integers. And this implies um, that if if p is prime, and this means p not a unit and not zero, and we're going to say if p equals a b, this implies um, a or b is a unit. This is actually not quite the usual definition of a prime in a ring, but never mind. So um, if p is prime, then p divides a b implies p divides a or p divides b. And the proof of this is just the same as for the integers. If p does not divide a, then p and a are co-prime because p is prime and it doesn't divide a. So xp plus y um, a is equal to 1 for um, some a and b. So, sorry, for some x and y. And if we multiply it by b, we find xpb plus yab is equal to b. And now we notice that both of these are divisible by p, so p divides b. It is this is divisible by p because a times b is equal to p. And just as before, this rather easily implies that anything can be written as a um, product of primes. You remember the main point is to show that if we've got primes p1, p2, up to pm, which is equal to q1, q2, up to qn, if all these are primes, then p1 must divide the product of q1 up to qn, so it must divide one of them, say q2, um, now, now, since q2 is also a prime, this means that p1 must be equal to, say, q2, and you can then cross off p1 and q2 and, and continue pairing off the primes. So uh, a Euclidean ring implies unique factorization in just the same way that it does for the integers. And this is completely useless unless we have... Um, several um, good examples of Euclidean rings. So, so let's find some examples of Euclidean rings. Well, what I mentioned earlier is you just take the real numbers, um, polynomials over the real numbers, and this has division with remainder. So every polynomial can be written um, in an essentially unique way as a, as a product of irreducible polynomials. In fact, over the reals, the irreducible polynomials are all either linear or quadratic, so x squared plus bx plus c, except sometimes these break off as a product of two linear factors. Um, um, there's another um, slightly more interesting example of a Euclidean ring. which is the so-called Gaussian integers. So the Gaussian integers are all integers of the form m plus n i for m n integers and i the square root of minus 1. So this is a subring of the complex numbers. And we can draw a picture of the Gaussian integers just as a sort of rectangular grid. So if we draw a grid like this then the Gaussian integers are going to be all these points here, where, as usual, we denote numbers in the complex plane as um, ordered pairs. So this is 0, and this is 1, and this is i, this is 1 plus i, 
uh, this is 2 plus i, and so on. Um, and we can get the Gaussian integers by taking the ring of polynomials over z and quotienting it out by the ideal of all multiples of x squared plus 1. So the Gaussian integers are an example of a quotient of rings. And now what we want to do is to show the Gaussian integers are Euclidean. So what do we need to show? We need to show that given a and b, we can find that a is equal to q times b plus r, with r is less than, uh, with naught less than or equal to r is less than um, b. This is for b not equal to zero, of course. I, I think I forgot to say b was non-zero. Um, so what do we use as the absolute value? Well, we want the absolute value to be an integer, so we can't take the usual complex absolute value. What we do is we say the absolute value of x plus i y is now going to be x squared plus y squared, which is the square of the distance from the origin. And now we've got to prove this result. So given a and b, we want to write a over b is equal to q plus r over um, b, where we want this to have absolute value less than 1. And what this is saying is the distance between the complex number a over b and the number q is at most 1. So what we do is we take all the points, all the Gaussian integers, and draw a little circle of radius 1 about these integers. And now you can see that these little disks of radius 1 um, all cover the complex plane. So if you've got any number q, so, so any number a over b, say a over b is here, a over b is inside one of these disks. That means there is at least one complex number so who's, such that the unit disk around that point contains q. For instance, in this case, the complex number q would be there. So because these unit disks cover the plane, um, there is a Euclidean algorithm. And therefore, the Gaussian integers also have unique factorization into primes. Um, we're going to see that turning up later on in the course when we look at ways of representing numbers as a sum of two squares. Um, you notice that the absolute value of x plus i, y in this um, in this notation is just x squared plus y squared. This is the square of the usual complex absolute value. And now we 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 we, we can get the following interesting property by multiplying complex numbers. If we multiply x plus i y times um, um, a plus i b, we get this is x a minus y b plus i times a y plus x b. Now the complex numbers of the property that um, x y is equal to the absolute value of x times the absolute value of y, as you can easily check. Now this means that the absolute value of x plus i y, which is x squared plus y squared, times the absolute value of a plus i b, which is a squared plus b squared, is equal to x a minus y b squared plus a y plus x b squared. And what this says is that if two integers m and n are the sum of two squares, so is their product m times n, because here's a way of writing their product as a sum of two squares. So this is going to be m and this is going to be n. And we'll use this later when investigating which integers are the sums of two squares. And in fact, we will also be using the fact that the um, Gaussian integers form a unique factorization domain. Um, now, we notice with the integers mod m that the integers modulo p are rather special. They have the property that any non-zero element has an inverse. In other words, a, if we've got an element a, um, which is co-prime to p, this implies a, b is congruent to 1 mod p for some 
B. And that follows from Euclid's algorithm, you remember, because we can solve A um, um, x plus um, P y is equal to 1, and then x is just the inverse of A. Um, and um, rings in which any non-zero element has an inverse are called, are called fields. So a field is just a ring such that all non-zero elements have an inverse. So let's figure out some examples of fields. So these are fields, and these are going to be not fields. So examples of fields are the reals, R, and the complex number C. And we've just seen another important example of this course is the integers modulo P for P prime. Um, things that are not fields are things like the integers. Um, so the integer is not a field. Um, another example of something is not, that is not a field is Z over MZ for um, m not prime. By the way, I should say in a field, it also has to have the, the condition that 1 is not equal to 0. So the integers modulo 1 um, are still not a, a, a field. Um, for instance, uh, you know, z modulo 6z is not a field because 2 times 3 is equal to 0. So 2 and 3 don't have inverses. Um, another um, important example of a field is or something that is sometimes a field is let's take any field k and let's take the ring of polynomials over k and let's quotient it out by all multiples of f where f is irreducible and this is now a field for much the same reason that z over pz is a field you see um Irreducible polynomials are exactly the analogues of prime numbers. Um, and the proof that z modulo pz is a field goes over to showing that k of x over f is a field whenever f is irreducible. And of course, the, the, the example of this that everybody knows is if you take the reals modulo the irreducible polynomial x squared plus 1, this is a field, a field of complex numbers. And if we take k x modulo f, where f is not irreducible, then this is not a field for much the same reason that z over mz is not a field when um, m is um, not a prime. Um, we also notice that if k is any field, then k of x has division with the remainder. You can um, divide any polynomial by another, and the, the remainder is going to be a polynomial of smaller degree, unless you're trying to divide by zero, in which case you're kind of stupid. So um, it has unique factorization. Um, k, we, we mentioned this earlier when k is the real numbers, but in fact k can be any field, and this still has unique factorization. In particular, um, we can talk about primes and irreducible elements in this. Um, and we now have analogues of things like, can we find all primes in K of X? Well, sometimes we can. We can use the sieve of Eratosthenes. So you remember the sieve of Eratosthenes for the integers, we write down all the integers, we cross off the zero and the units, and then the first one is a prime, then we cross off all multiples of it, then the next one is prime, and we cross off all multiples of that, and the next one is prime, and so on. And we can sometimes do exactly the same thing to find irreducible polynomials. So let's do an example of this. Let's take the field K to be the field with two elements. So it's just got two elements, 0 and 1. So what we do is, instead of writing out all positive integers, we write out all polynomials over this field. So we get 0, 1, x, x plus 1, x squared, x squared plus 1, x squared plus x, 
x squared plus x plus 1, x cubed, x cubed plus 1, x cubed plus x, and so on. This is getting a bit boring. Um, and what we do to find out all the irreducible polynomials, we can do exactly what we did before. We cross off the zero and the units, and then the first one on our list is a prime or irreducible, and now we cross off all multiples of it, so we cross off everything divisible by um, x, and then the next one is going to be um, another polynomial, another irreducible polynomial, and now we cross off all multiples of this. So um, we notice that x squared plus 1 is actually equal to x plus 1 squared. Remember, 2 is equal to 0 because we're working over the, the, the field of two elements. Um, and um, x cubed plus 1 is also a multiple of x plus 1, so we should so we should um, need to cross that one off. We should cross that one off as well. Um, and the next one on our list is another irreducible element, and then we can then go off crossing um, um, crossing off multiples of this and so on. So, so the the next two primes, if you if you want to continue this a bit further, will be x cubed plus x plus one and x cubed plus x squared plus one, and you can go on happily listing primes uh, for as long as your patience holds out, which probably isn't very long because this is kind of boring. Um, so um, we can do other things with this that we did for the integers. You, you remember Euclid proved that the number of primes is infinite. And the way he did that was he took all the primes you thought of so far, you multiply them together, we add one, and we take some prime factor of this, and that must be a new prime. And you notice the same proof works for polynomials over the field with two elements. Um, in fact, it works for polynomials over any field. If we found some irreducible polynomials p1 to pk, we can multiply them all together add one to it and take an irreducible polynomial dividing that and that would be a new irreducible polynomial um, it can't be equal to any of these because then it would divide one so the number of irreducible polynomials um, over any field is always infinite actually if, if the field is infinite this is completely trivial because you can just take the polynomials x minus a for a in the field but if a field is finite like this little field of order two it's not quite so obvious so so you can use um, um, euclid's um, euclid's proof that there are an infinite number of primes um, so um uh, next lecture, I'll be talking more about um, properties of fields and their relation to number theory. In particular, I'll be saying more about the finite fields.